Welcome, welcome, welcome to what I believe is episode four of Unnamed. Going on episode four, still haven't changed the name, Fowler. You are Owen four. So you, you need to you need to come up with a more convincing uh, argument to change the name, and then maybe I'll consider it as a gesture of our friendship and my good faith. I uh, I nominate the name poorly named unnamed. No, or I I mad still good beans. No, it's weak old beans. <laughs> weak old beans. Weak I old that beans. Too. <laughs> for, <laughs> for those of you, so I I I was in my kitchen the other day, and I I. I like pinto beans. I really like pinto beans, like, a lot. I love pinto beans. I could eat pinto beans, like, just straight from the can. And I had, I was making a pasta salad to take, and I'll put pinto beans in the pasta salad, uh, with some really good vinaigrette, cucumbers, onions, uh, uh, carrots, good stuff, salt, pepper, vinaigrette dressing, mix it all together, tastes wonderful. Tomatoes as well, uh, and I, and avocado. And, uh, sometimes a boiled egg, depending. This is not a cooking show. I'm going to continue with what I'm saying. Anyway, I, uh, and so I put like half the beans that I didn't use in a, in a, uh, in a jar and I forgot about them for like seven days. And I was trying to figure out a name for the podcast because, uh, my host here, Fowler, uh, doesn't like it, you know, which we don't give a fuck about his opinions over here. Uh, you know, he's just, he's just essentially, uh renting my audio equipment to use for the podcast uh so therefore his opinion is uh irrelevant to the conversation of what we should name the podcast but i uh i i opened up the refrigerator the other day and i i for some weird reason i saw the beans and they were weak old beans and i was like what if we name the podcast weak old beans uh and fowler thought it was it's the perfect name. Yeah, Weak Old Beans. So if the podcast name changes to Weak Old Beans, that's why. Just to give you all the backstory. Um, weak Old Beans with Weak Old News. That's yeah, how we roll. exactly. <laughs> it's, it's, it's fucking stupid. Anyway, welcome back to the podcast. We have a little bit of a lighter topic today. We're going to be talking about the history of Southern racism. <laughs> An easy thing to watch after you finish work. You yeah, know, you, you have a long day. You come home, you crack open a beer, and you talk about racism in the South. Yeah, and lynchings and all of those other dreadful, dreadful activities that uh, that uh, Southerners got up to back in the old days. Uh, so, but it's it's a good topic for both of us because um, we both lived in the South for a long time, and we're both not white. So it's you know, yeah. Well, I currently close to home. Yeah, um, I am. I am currently the resident Southerner uh, between the two of us. Uh, mm-hmm. Fowler's not. Fowler is not a Southerner. You. You didn't. You're not a. You. You lived in the South for like twenty minutes. You're a Yankee, okay? You mean eight years? Like twenty minutes. That's equivalent in dog years, or whatever. Uh, tortoise years. I'm sorry. So, d- yeah. Anywho. We're going to be talking about the history of Southern racism, and, and Fowler's going to be doing most of the heavy lifting, because um, he is the man of the house, and that's what men do. Uh, and I am a lady, and we are in the South, so uh, take it away, Fowler. Um, I think one of the really interesting things about Southern history, particularly populist Southern history, is... Um, how rare it is to have a southern populist leader who didn't rely on racism like i can think of only a couple the longs didn't really use racial rhetoric when they were running louisiana um tom watson at the early part of his career of the populist party in the 1800s or 1900s i'm sorry also didn't uh engage in that sort of stuff and um big jim Folsom, the governor of alabama but it's been the dream of many a man to build the poor white, poor black coalition in order to unite the South. And pretty much every time I've ever read about it, it, it failed. And everyone either jumped ship and became white supremacists or they uh, faded into relevancy. Yeah, the South is racked with a, a history of these, I mean, obviously racial tensions, but just 
the I don't want to say the inability of uh, coalition movements to fail, but just the inability of a of a widespread multiracial populist movement. And I uh, I've always been curious as to why that is. Um, I don't know if it's a if it's a method issue or if it's a leadership issue, but you know part of the reason in the South southern demagogues utilized racism so aggressively was because i mean it was it was very useful you had a i think up until fairly recently a you know very 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 large um black underclass that was either nearly proportional to or slightly less than the uh wealthier white majority um you know, and, and even the poor whites would not ally themselves with the poor blacks. I would argue because, and I don't know what you think about this, Fowler, but it, it might have been a proximity issue. Um, the poor black uh, southerners resided mostly in um, urban areas, whereas the poor white southerners resided in um, more rural areas. So there was not that proximity. I don't know if that's historically true because... Um, I could be totally industri- wrong industrialization came later but i think the problem still existed before although my education of southern history really starts cooking in the 1800s i don't know how things were in the 1700s hmm. i think it's just the problem with um i the i think there's always a problem with like building a coalition when you have xenophobic elements of the coalition like the republican party now would be so much smarter if they appealed to Latinos and broadened, you know, their appeal, they would be able to control so much more of the of the country. But they they can't because their um, their current white voter base is incredibly xenophobic, and they would lose like the Tea Party MAGA types pulling in the Hispanic populace. You know what I mean? And I think that's true of a lot of coalitions where. It's like, well, I could have this larger coalition that's multiracial, but like I risk in building that larger coalition, alienating my my base. And so I think most people ultimately will choose to side with their base, even if it means a smaller piece of the pie, if it's more stable and more reliable. Yeah, I definitely agree with that, um, with that as well. So it's a strategy, uh, strategy issue, you'd think, rather than or more than anything else. I mean, the thing that destroyed the uh, New Deal Democrats was the civil rights, um, because the the coalition only held together so long as people didn't talk about the race issue. So I think, I don't know if there has been a successful, in American history, blending of poor Southern whites and um, poor Southern blacks that hasn't meant losing one of the one of the two parties, you know? Yeah. It's kind of a bleak outcome a little bit because, because one of the things, uh, cause we Fowler and I have talked about this before and it's, I think it's a very difficult topic because, you know, like he just said, there hasn't been a successful, you know, black, white coalition. And then, you know, I, I would imagine that you know, the efforts that have been made to build a black and white coalition have ended in the leaders of said coalition being assassinated or I'm sorry, allegedly assassinated by the uh by the US government. Um so you know it, you know, one of the things I've tried to tried to reconcile with as we um as we talk about these topics, you know, outside of the podcast is like how does one build a coalition in such tumultuous, in such a tumultuous environment? Well, if you knew the answer to that question, you wouldn't be running a podcast. You'd be accepting your Nobel Peace Prize in Vienna. True King. Absolutely. (laughs) God. Um, I mean, maybe it's a time will tell situation. You know, maybe. I mean, it's I, it's the coalition has failed in both extremes because you have examples of like the LBJ 
you know, I'm going to go full on into civil rights, which cost the South, you know, to this day, really. Um, but then you have figures like Tom Watson, who attempted to basically not deal with the race issue directly and tried to basically make economic arguments that would benefit black people, but, you know, wasn't explicitly pro-black. And, you know, the populist party, which is the platform he dealt that on, that also failed. So, so can you, know, you tell us more? Cause you have more information about Tom Watson than I do. Um, Fowler knows some more about the early populist uh, coalitions in the South than me, which is, Probably sad, considering the fact that I am the resident Southerner and have been my entire life. Uh, <laughs> um, so could you tell could you tell me and tell people listening because I I this will be new to me more about why Tom Watson's movement failed and like kind of the inner workings of of why that movement really really failed was it a you know, was it because he didn't touch race directly that it alienated black voters or was it something else? So Tom Watson was one of the principal architects of the Populist Party, which was basically uh, a coalition of like Southerners and Midwesterners, particularly farmers, who wanted, they were sort of an offshoot of Jeffersonian um, populists, but their change was Jefferson and the like thought that this, the government should remain small so that like the farmers and the small businessmen would be able to like do their affairs without meddling. And the Populist Party and Tom Watson and the like, they essentially realized that they needed the government to be powerful in order to um, fight corporate power. And so the Populist Party was a third party, um, mainly led by poor farmers, poor rural farmers. That was attempting to like take the presidency with uh, Williams Jennings Bryan as the the president candidate and Tom Watson being the vice president. And um, Tom Watson did a lot of things to try and build this coalition. Um, he is one of the architects of the broad coalition, multiracial coalition. He tried to um, help get um, black representatives in state. He tried to allied directly with black ministers that um, had pull over like black voters. He did a lot of sort of conciliatory gestures. And the, the fine line he walked is he wasn't overtly for helping the black race, but he basically pushed like broad economic policy that would help black people sort of um, incidentally almost. And it didn't really work. Um, there was... The, the Populist Party just wasn't able to build momentum as a third party, you know. The rural voters just didn't have the power in that election. And Tom Watson kind of tragically would later become a white supremacist and one of the worst anti-Semites in his time period. And mm. he sort of abandoned the mission. So this is another, uh, another thing that Fowler and I have talked about. And I think it's something that I, you know, as I started really getting into politics and, and, you know, becoming educated on politics, I, one of the things that I learned, and it's something that I think a lot of people don't take into account, is that oftentimes, and this is something that had been foreign to me prior to getting into politics, because I had gone into it with this naive assumption that, you know, I knew that people could lie about facts. Like I knew that politicians would lie about things, you know, like if they, you know, if, if, if they, if something happened, you know, I knew that they would distort or adjust or tweak the facts a bit to fit whatever narrative they were pushing. But something I never considered was the idea that somebody could be, could not believe in the things that they were trying to sell to the public. And I think with figures like Tom Watson and, and, you know, other figures now, Fowler, you would know this more than me, but there's, it seems to be the instance that oftentimes, you know, politicians will lie about their, about their entire positions, you know, and, and it's, it's what makes racial politics so contentious and so dangerous is that, you know, you'll have a person in a position of authority who will essentially 
not believe any of the things they're saying about the groups of people they're saying them about. Um, but they'll use the animosity that they know their base has for that group of people, which is oftentimes a very real animosity, you know, um, mm -hmm. it's, it's the animosity oftentimes of the public is not fake. Um, it's, it's oftentimes very genuine and very real. Um, they'll use that animosity as a way to get themselves into power and they'll embolden it and, uh, enable it oftentimes this is i think particularly true for politicians who they excel at moving the masses or like the the working class you know because a lot of times like historically most people in politics are the wealthy and the powerful and so like a lot of that duality i think comes from well-educated people in a certain strata or class who manipulate people outside their class by pretending to be one of them and and pushing for those things. And there are definitely many examples historically, like George Wallace being the prominent one, of um, sort of populist leaders who, instead of uniting the working class, um, sort of perpetuate prejudices and biases that they already have in order to assume power. Yeah. Um... And that's a, a very, very dangerous game um, that oftentimes leads to negative circumstances. Um, and it's what made, and I'll bring them up, but it's what made the Nazis, I think, so deadly is the fact that uh, it's the fact that what made Hitler and his, you know, his inner circle different is that they were true believers in what they were saying. Um they they believed the shit that they were saying so i think the nazis thing is a very interesting point and i think that we're kind of living through a time period where th where there are more true believers in charge because like with the southern strategy if people don't know the idea was the gop deliberately um tried to get racist former dixie uh crats to basically vote for them by um attacking welfare and making sort of dog whistle arguments that would draw racist voters to the Republican Party. And I think the distinction between like a Trump type and like a Nixon type is like for uh, 20th century Republicans, the racism wasn't the ideological goal. The racism was a way of getting poorly educated voters to vote for them to achieve their actual economic goals, um, like neoliberalism. But with a figure like Trump, unlike Nixon or unlike Reagan, the racism isn't just a way of pulling voters to you. The racism is the point. Like, it's deliberately white nationalist. And the economic policies are secondary, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, it is an incredibly dangerous position to be in when you have true believers running the show, basically. Um, and so... Just something to consider, not not to fear monger or anything like that. But um, when it comes to the history of like Southern, you know, race relations and whatnot, um, what's always interested me is, you know, not just the coalition building, but also, um, but also, just figures like Vardaman. Uh, why don't you tell the people? <laughs> Vardaman. You can talk about Vardaman. Oh, you we want me to talk about your boy, Var your, your boy Vardaman? <laughs> My uh, best friend. Your yeah. best friend. Oh, God. So Vardaman was the, um, I think, 37th governor of Mississippi, if I remember correctly. Uh, he was a real swell guy. Uh, <laughs> Uh, he was. He, he has the distinction of being possibly the most racist historical figure I've ever read about in American history. Yeah, it's it's a lot. Like I, it's uh, he's basically like if uh, um, Uncle Ruckus from Boondocks were real, but like a white man. <laughs> like the all. Main, the main thing that I will always remember about Vardaman is when Booker T. Washington, the black. Uh, activist went to meet Teddy Roosevelt in the White House. Vardaman said that because a black man had dined there, 
they needed to burn the White House to the ground and rebuild it because it had been irreparably contaminated. Yeah. Um, but Vardaman, he was kind of like that. His actual policies were very anti-corporatist, you know, anti-pro-union, uh, anti, uh, you know, anti-big business. But he was just violently racist. That's, I think, a common thing of a lot of Dixiecrats. Like, a lot of the Dixiecrats were for welfare. They were for helping the poor. Just not poor black people. They were for a larger welfare state, but only for whites. And um, I think with the GOP, that's changed, where a lot of the race baiters in the modern Republican Party, they aren't New Deal Democrats. They're Republicans. And so the there is no caveat of like you actually are fine with welfare it just has to be the right type of people but there's some residue of that left over i think um within the voting base um what do you uh, mean well i I think there's a statistic that uh that says that like isn't it like red state conservative voters are okay with welfare as long as it's the right type of people getting the welfare quote unquote yeah i think i've heard that before um and so but i would imagine that's left over from that that you know dixiecrat generation um even if the party itself has kind of moved on from that the party itself has moved on from being anti you know i think the gop is you know there's there's a in a weird way, they've backslid because they're not pro welfare for anybody. You know what I mean? Uh, at the very least, the the Southern Dixiecrats were pro welfare for you know in concept, but the modern GOP is just anti welfare. Period. I mean, with the exception of figures like Teddy Roosevelt and like Dwight Eisenhower, like the moderate Republicans who were for welfare lost the the it's the radical like fuck fuck the poor people who basically took over the republican party in the 20th century hmm and that all started with reagan right was that i mean it, it depends reagan is the golden boy he's them at the peak of their power but it it started with goldwater i think hmm. i don't know maybe historians have other arguments hmm. oh it's um i think i think very few people are principally against the government helping them like most voters who are antagonistic to big government are i think antagonistic because they don't understand they don't believe that that can actually help them in any meaningful way you know what i mean yeah like i think the elections of people like the long brothers sort of indicate that like in the right hands if you think that the government is helping you you're going to back that person i think very few people are principally you know against the government any form and that's not just true of uh poor voters it's also true of businessmen like there's no one who gets more welfare in america than corporations and oh yeah of course people like elon musk yeah or they get bailed out uh as we saw during the pandemic um But I wonder if that's a issue with our economy overall, maybe more so, because on the one hand, you know, when you build a society where, you know, I think it was, you know, where certain banks that pretty much hold our economy together, that they are so powerful that they can't fail, you know, um, it, it, it puts you in a very precarious position where you kind of have to bail them out or risk tanking your economy in you know an irreparable way and then of course if you don't have a strong middle class you know and and strong businesses small businesses to sort of pick up the pieces you and which we don't anymore since the pandemic um it's almost like there's no other option you know yeah i mean one of the great lies is the big government versus big business thing like historically um businesses um expand and grow more powerful through the loans and military protection of the government and in the same way like the the movers and shakers of politics have always been big business 
being willing to shell out the money that they have to help candidates win or to move the the the, the line you know the you know they they work quite well together it isn't like there's some ideological revulsion between the two of them they often are in bed together against everyone else yeah so i it makes sense as to why corporatist can or anti-corporatist candidates don't do as well uh <laughs> you know it's i'm uh, hoping i'm hoping that will change with the internet like bernie represents like with like the grass online donations and stuff like that he represents like a way for people to actually outfund these big like leviathan companies you know in a in an older time i don't think that would have been possible so i'm i'm optimistic about like people power really being able to push for change but like you know i think that's a relatively recent um recent thing yeah 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 it's uh the internet has changed the game you know so when it comes to like southern racism what was the role if you can work you know if you know have this information of like the media back during tom watson's time watson's time when it came to like amplifying it was um, newspapers newspapers yeah did they operate it's, pretty much the same as news does today i mean you had to be literate to consume it so it's a much smaller demographic and newspapers were not as um consolidated as networks like pretty much anyone in their grandma could make a newspaper if they wanted to i know what job you got to do fowler <laughs> get to get to newspapering i think the time of newspapering might be a little start past. a blog all right the equivalent of the of the 1920s newspaper is the pinterest blog. you mean you mean 1860s 1860s yeah whatever in the 1920s <laughs> they at least had a radio which definitely helped the process true i'm gonna kill every single person in my vicinity making this goddamn background noise holy shit i'm gonna kill all your people too uh fowler just to let you know i'm uh i'm living in bliss i don't hear any of it on yeah because you got those big ass fucking elephant headphones on your fucking head that's why I'm looking like dumbo I'm, Dumbo uh, can fly. Dumbo's a badass. I don't know why you're trying to. Dumbo, Dumbo can. Dumbo can glide. They cannot fly. Dumbo, Dumbo is a genetic masterpiece. He's one of the greatest characters ever. He can I glide. Mean, okay, no flying. He can't flap. He flap flap his big ass ears and fly. He can yes, glide. He, yes, he can. No, he can't. It's been a while. It's been I've a not while, seen the film I'm in such sure. a long time. I don't think he can. He, I actually legitimately to... don't think he can fly. I think he can. I think he glides, but I don't think he flaps his ears and flies. I think he does. I don't think he does. I think you're full of shit, and you don't know what the hell you're talking about. You know, Dumbo is. Uh, I don't know how well it's aged. I mean, the the main crow guy is literally called Jim Crow, so it might be a little. <laughs> Dude, fuck! I forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> At least he doesn't do a minstrel show. At least it's the yes he does. Do you not? Yeah, I remember that part very well. He does do. They had to like edit that out when they did the they they did the remake. They were just like, yeah, he's not here anymore. It's not a thing because <laughs> he never did that. Just forget. Who, no, who he does. Dumbo the feather that he 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 has like a, a hat on and he talks in like jive, in like the original. He does like I swear to God, it is a minstrel show. I'm, you know, it's kind of funny. You, uh, you bowed to my superior knowledge about southern demagogues. I bow to your knowledge about Dumbo. I'm yeah. sure you know so much more than I do about that <laughs> subject. So I, I won't challenge you. Yeah, which one of us is carrying the podcast? Okay, <laughs> I'm the heart of this operation. You might be the brains, but I'm the beaten heart with blood running through it. Uh, that gives you audio equipment to use since you you can't buy your own literally the mic and the headphones are mine the only thing you have is the actual yeah i showed you i showed you how to use them so god i'm like a prodigy i learned so quickly <laughs> not without me not without me dear 
Fuck, we need to go on to a lot. We need to stop talking about racism. Racism is old news. As they said, and it's always sunny. <laughs> racism. Boring. Let's move along. What is it? Racism is badass. I'm kidding. <laughs> it's an always sunny quote for those of you who who haven't seen the show. I've never seen It's Always Sunny. Surprise. I just know that one quote from Danny DeVito where he says suicide is badass. It's the only yeah i don't i don't know what they're paying danny devito but it should be monstrous like disgusting amounts of money given the insane shit that he does on that show that will stop him from ever having a job anywhere else <laughs> no we were uh we were gonna do a rapid fire for this episode and and we couldn't come up with the topic and then fowler was like what if we talked about racism for like 45 minutes and i was like sure fuck it and so that's that's what we did but uh, we wanted to talk about history because, you know, if there's one thing that Fowler and I have in common is that we have an insatiable thirst for knowledge. Um, so, you know, we both just really, really like to learn things. Uh, and and it's, you know, he's a bit stronger in his rhetoric than I am, mostly because I film this podcast at night and I want to pass out every time I film it. Uh, but you You choose the time, though. This is self-inflicted. I choose the time because, unlike you, I have things to do during the day. I have a life. The enemy, this is some fascist shit. The enemy is both strong and weak. Fowler <laughs> controls the podcast, and yet he, does, he doesn't even have the equipment. Yeah, I no. see what's happening Don't here. listen to him. It's because I have life outside of the podcast, unlike Fowler, who sits in his dark little room, like, like fucking Emperor Palpatine, just staring at a computer screen all day. What do you mean? Emperor Palpatine had a rich life. He was a senator. He uh, had friends. He was doing Order 66. He was a busy man. You see what I have no to one, deal with. No one in the galaxy worked harder than Emperor Palpatine. You know what? Considering the fact that he orchestrated two massive conflicts at the same time, you're probably correct. That man probably got absolutely no sleep whatsoever. <laughs> he did not sleep. Shit, I wouldn't sleep too. I'd be nervous as hell. Anxiety out the ass. You know? if it, It's like you have two different phones with two different bitches numbers on it. And at any point, you can... <laughs> you gotta make sure you don't call the wrong woman. <laughs> it's a good he orders, orders 66 on the wrong phone. Yeah, and it's like... Connects him to the Jedi Council. Yeah, it's like, uh-oh. <laughs> Whoopsie daisy. To be fair, um, the Republic accepts a random army that they didn't commission or buy without checking whether the army was actually controlled by them. It was kind of an L for the uh, for the Republic. It was controlled by Sifo Diaz. Don't you remember that part of the movie? S- supposedly, but like... Yeah, they didn't fact check. Of, it's, it's kind of convenient that a giant army just showed up in the middle of them having a conflict and then... They just uncritically made that military just control everything in the Republic. It was a little sussy, you know? Yeah. And they knew it wasn't Sifo Diaz because he di- because Obi-Wan says that he died earlier than when it was commissioned. I've so not seen... I knew, the Jedi knew he was full, that, that the Sifo Diaz shit was full of shit. And they still decided to entrust their lives to this random army that they didn't know why it was created or where it was created or who created it. It was a little sussy. That's all I'm saying. You've not seen Clone Wars, have you? Uh, The TV show? Yeah, the the TV show. I haven't seen the TV show. Okay, It's a good TV show if you get the chance to watch it. I've, I've, I, my remembrance of. Uh, arcane Star Wars facts is just eluding me. I'm sorry. Such a fucking nerd, Fowler. Holy shit. I know, I'm more of a Trekkie myself. But, you know, I Which one of us has the Star Trek tattoo, my friend? It's not you. (laughs) (laughs) Listen, Star Trek is... Don't test me. uh, It's it's futurist in a way that uh, I think Star Wars isn't. Like, Star Trek is like, they don't have fucking money, they don't really have scarcity, like... They, um, you know, they don't really have like a military sometimes like it's it's like a very futuristic, you know, um, world versus Star Wars where, you know, it's it's basically just the medieval era, but like we're in space, 
and we have laser swords, you know? That's what makes it cool, though. I like medieval space wizards with their fucking derpy lightsabers and their uh, uh, p- weird political bullshit that gets them all killed in the end because Yoda didn't check his grinder account or some shit like that. I don't know. I like uh, I like Star Wars. I'm I'm a Star Wars person. I like both. I, I think they both bring different things to the table in terms of content. So I won't knock Star Wars or Star Trek. I think they're both special in their own way. Uh, and I like both of the series for what they are. That's that's I'm locking in my answer there, Fowler. Is that good for you? That's fine. Star Trek is objectively better than Star Wars, but they're both. All okay. right. I see you're taking the uh, taking the confrontational opinion here. Don't firebomb his house if you happen to find it online he is a good man he means well he's just a little bit uh he's a little bit high right now he didn't mean what he said uh so just just keep that in mind. i meant every word you know you know what no you didn't you you've been you need to go to so we need to end the podcast right now you don't you don't know what you're talking about fowler it's okay though if you take a nap take a xanax you'll be fine tomorrow by my host oh you cut out so nobody heard that so we're gonna end the podcast <laughs> We're going to end the podcast now. <laughs> Perfect timing for you to for your audio to stop working. Uh We're going to end the podcast now. I hope you guys don't lean in to the mic. I will reach my arm through the screen and I will slap you. Hail Hydra. Oh, okay. Uh anyway, I hope you guys like this episode and I hope you guys tune into the next one. I am your host Ardot. I didn't even introduce myself. At the beginning. I'm Ardot, and that is my host. Say your name. I am Fowler. All right, I am Fowler. It's a... <laughs> Thank you for hanging with us. Uh, I hope to see y'all in the next podcast. Hopefully we'll be getting back into some politics. Um, it's been a slow news week. That's partially why we did this episode kind of light. You know, if you can call Southern racism a light topic. But uh, that's that's partially why we did it, because the news week has been rather... Uh, rather slow. So thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you in the next video.